Okay, let's begin the general discussion. So the first question is about whether the ability to analyze this book as a piece of literature has some relationship to whether it is a good book. Uh, so I talked to group one about this question and they believe that there is no relation that uh, most people who read this book will read it as uh, something for fun. So whether or not we can analyze the book and uh, find something meaningful or whether or not the book says something meaningful about the world does not really affect whether people will like the book. They will like the book or not based on the story uh, and the story alone. We can take a closer look at this question by looking at page 18 of the introduction. Near the bottom. What does the author say about this? Uh, last paragraph. Uh, line three. I have a master's degree in literature. And in writing Ender's Game, I deliberately avoided all the little literary games and gimmicks that make fine writing so impenetrable to the general audience. All the layers of meaning are there to be decoded if you like to play the game of literary criticism. But if you don't care to play that game, that's fine with me. I designed Ender's Game to be as clear and accessible as any story of mine could possibly be. My goal was that the reader wouldn't have to be trained in literature or even in science fiction to receive the tale in its simplest, purest form. So on the one hand, it looks like the author has the same idea as group one, that the uh, even though we can subject this book to literary criticism and analysis, as we have been doing throughout this semester or the second half of this semester. Uh, it's not necessary in order to decide whether you like the book or not. But I want to draw your attention to how the author describes the so-called game of literary criticism. On page 18, two, three lines from the bottom, he says, I'm sorry, four lines from the bottom, he says, I deliberately avoided all the little literary games and gimmicks that make fine writing so impenetrable to the general audience. Impenetrable here means unable to be understood. So it seems like when the author is talking about literary criticism, he's talking about a kind of writing that the reader can only understand if they try to analyze it. If, as I often say, they read it with their brain turned on. Uh, and so the author set out to write a book that would be understandable even if you don't turn on your brain. But in this class, we have turned on our brains. We have looked at this book, hopefully, uh, and thought about this book while reading it. And so the question is therefore not whether it is better to turn your brain on or off. The question is what kind of book could likely be a better book? The author has written a book that can be read without analyzing it, and yet we have been analyzing it, and I think we have produced some interesting thoughts on this book. Does that make it a better book than another book which would not produce inter interesting ideas if we think about it? Uh, it's kind of like this. When you buy a car, if you only live in the city, you don't need a powerful, fancy car. But you could still buy one. Would a car that is able to be driven in the city and in the mountains be a better car than a simple city car? That's the question uh, that I'm asking here. And I think in some ways it could be. It's kind of like um, 
and see is there another good example I can use? It's kind of like a building. If you only use the ninth floor, you don't really care about what the lower eight floors look like, but it would be better for you if those eight floors were built very well. If they were not built very well and there's like an earthquake, then the building might collapse. And yet you don't use those eight floors anyway. In a similar way, a book that can successfully be analyzed shows that the author had a clear and consistent vision when writing the book, that the author knew what he wanted to say, knew what he wanted to go in the story. He had more control over the book, uh, over the story, over the characters. And that kind of control, I think, is more likely to produce a fun and entertaining book if the author wants it to be fun and entertaining. And in this case, the author does want it to be fun and entertaining, right? He says he wrote it so that anyone would enjoy this book, even if you don't think about it as literature. So the comparison case would be a novel written by an author who also wanted to write a fun and exciting, uh, don't need to turn on your brain kind of book. But this second author did not have as much control over the book, over the story and the characters. Do you think it would be less likely to be a fun and a successful book? Could be. It could be equally fun uh, if the author is lucky. But it, I think there's a higher chance that it would be a failure of a book if the author does not have enough control over the materials. So even if when you read a book, you're not in the habit of analyzing and doing literary criticism, I think this is still something that we can keep in mind. How much does the author care about the details? How much does the author really understand the story that they want to tell? How much control do they have? Uh, not only over the story and characters, but also control over the ideas of the book and the language of the book. In the past few weeks, I have sometimes pointed out specific passages that I think were written very well. The author has a solid control of the language used as well. And language is something that will affect any reader. Even if you don't analyze the sentences, you can feel if a sentence is a better sentence or a worse sentence. So that part I think is still relevant for every reader. Other ideas, other questions? Okay, let's move on to new number two. Uh, the people who dislike Ender's Game. So I talked to group three about this. Uh, the people the author mentions are all parents uh, and the main reason they dislike the book is they think that no kid would really think like this or no kid would really be so smart um, and group three thinks that's bullshit uh, group three thinks that um, these parents as the author says do not always entirely understand their how uh, sophisticated and complex their children may be uh, and in fact, uh, some members of group three even said that maybe parents don't want to face that possibility. Because if they have been raising their kid by treating them as idiots, how uh, inconvenient would it be for them to suddenly realize that their kid is also just another human being? It would require lots of self-reflection and uh, changes to parenting style and just lots of trouble. So some parents may simply want to set that aside and continue pretending that their kids are, uh, we're going to talk about this in, in question three, that they are simply uh, a lower class of people, not entirely human. Um, some parents might 
recognize the possibility that their kids uh, know more than uh, people expect children to know. According to group three, however, these parents might also choose to continue raising their kids as if they were idiots, because when these parents themselves were growing up, uh, they may have again and again realized that what they were thinking as children was wrong. They continually were proven wrong, and so by the power of experience and adulthood, these parents might make uh, decisions for their kids or try to give their kids so-called correct ideas. In the end, also treating these children as not entirely human people. Um, as for the second part of this question, uh, are there other reasons to dislike the book? Group three says there are. It's much too simplified. War is not so straightforward. Um, we don't really get a good understanding of Ender, and also he doesn't really feel that smart, uh, as smart as everyone says he is. Uh, and it, the aliens also don't seem to be well described. We don't really understand the aliens a lot either. Uh, as Group 3 said, the book sort of stays on the surface of many of these issues. Uh, and I do think that makes sense. Um, this book was written early in the author's career. After the book became famous, he later wrote um, four, I think, sequels. And then he wrote a companion book, and that book had four sequels. And then he wrote, uh, I think, three prequels. So it's a whole thing. There's a lot of story that can still be developed. Uh, and so I think the author also would agree that this book, Ender's Game, stays on the surface of many issues. Um, in my discussion with Group 3, I pointed out that this book was written for teenagers. But that just brings us back to the original question. Should we be treating children differently? And Group 3 pointed out that maybe instead of deciding what children would read, we can design the book uh, cover and uh, advertisements to be accurate to the book and let the book choose its readers. And maybe that would be a more, um, it would result in more genuine connections uh, with readers who would appreciate this kind of book. I don't know. Do you guys think that there are other reasons why people might not like this book? Uh, I've been reading and teaching this book for a long time, uh, and I was talking about it with a friend of mine, and he said, um, in Chinese, he said, it's too um, comical and like uh, immature. I think this is what uh, Group 3 was saying when they said that Ender is not really that smart. Um, someone famous once said that uh, the smartest person in a book can never be smarter than its author. It's impossible. So if the author is not a genius, I think it's hard for us to expect that the main character would be an actual genius. So how do you turn a non-genius main character into a genius? You make him really, really young, so it's more unexpected. And you make everyone around him idiots. So he's a genius by comparison. But if everybody around him is an idiot, then the book does feel less mature. It does feel like it stays on the surface a lot, instead of really talking about people's thinking and psychology. Because if it did go into detail about psychology, you, it's hard to make someone's thinking uh, realistic if you have to make them stupid, but you can't call them stupid. Right? So this is a problem of the um, writing craft. It's a technical issue. Um, but yes, that could also be a reason why someone might not like this book. Okay, let's move on to question three. This one, uh, 
was given also to group one. Children are a perpetual self renewing underclass. The idea is that there will always be children and these children will never have power because society would treat them like children. And this goes back to uh, the last question, the previous question. We we're talking about how parents often either accidentally or intentionally will treat their children different from an average human being. Uh, and group one agrees with this statement. If many people continue to have this attitude towards children, then indeed the children of every age are treated as less than other people. They are indeed the lowest class of society. Even uh, if a child gets, you know, lots of money and toys and resources, they don't have power. They can't make decisions about their own life. The stereotype is if you let your kid decide what to have for dinner for a whole week, every week they will say ice cream. Do you think that's true? If you let a kid decide what to eat, they will always say candy, ice cream, cake. Maybe I think maybe the first two days, yes, but then they'll, they'll kind of get sick of it and want to eat something more. I think maybe by the end of the week, they'll start eating healthy food just because they feel so terrible. Um, I have a personal story, actually. So when I was a kid, I loved to watch TV. Like, um, I would watch TV from after school all the way through dinner until like 8 or 9 p.m. I would just sit myself on the couch and keep watching. Uh, one day, I was again sitting on the couch watching TV. The show was over, and the TV channel uh, said what the next few shows would be. And I didn't want to watch the next show, but I wanted to watch the show after that, so I thought, okay, I'll just watch the next one just to wait for the following show. And then I realized how stupid that idea was, that I would waste a whole half hour on a show I did not like simply so I could watch the show after that. And then I, when I thought about it some more, I realized that I didn't even like the next show that much either. So why am I sitting here watching TV? And so I turned off the TV and I never watched TV again. I'm joking, I did watch TV later, but I didn't watch as much TV uh, after that. Uh, so I do think that if you let children make their own choices, they will one day start to make better choices. Maybe not perfect choices, but I think they, they do have the ability to reflect on what they're doing and think about why they're doing it or why they're not doing it and improve a bit. You don't have to make every decision for your child. Other thoughts or questions? All right, question four. Group two. Once again, because you're close enough, I did not talk about this with you. So I'm eager to find out what you think. This, this question basically is asking, how much blame should be put on Ender? And uh, so by discussing that, you can also discuss like the collective responsibility of humanity, Graph, all of these other people. Um, the first question about uh, do you agree with uh, humanity's stance against the aliens? I think uh, Yes, because, because yeah, the soldiers are told to do what they should do. So uh, wars happen, right? So they're just obeying the rules. So I, I don't. I think I do agree with uh, the their stance against the aliens. And about the question that uh, do do I think C Colonel Graf should. Uh, do I think how much pain do you think Colonel Graf should bear? 
I think she shouldn't take any blames because that he is just do, uh, doing what he was told to do. So there's no point in blaming him. There's literally no reason because it's how war works. That's how it works. People die. People live. Live to live in a、uh, live to see another day. That's literally how it works. So I don't think he should take any blames. But some people might think otherwise because uh, they uh, especially maybe anti-war people. They might protesters. They might、uh, disagree with what I said. But I think Colonel Graf shouldn't take any blames. In my personal opinion, and about the last question, uh, why do you think it makes sense for Ender to bear so much guilt? I think it's because that、uh, he was tricked into killing people, right? First of all, do you think it makes sense? Like, why is it ah, do you? No, I don't think、uh, Ender should bear that much guilt on him because he was tricked into murdering people, and because in the in page two hundred and yeah in two hundred and ninety eight, it、uh, he said that Graf said that of course we tricked you into it. That's the whole point. Which indicates that he wasn't the type of guy because he has too much compassion, and he wasn't the type of person to enjoying killing people like、uh, the Nazis, right? So, Graf had to trick him into murdering people, murdering people. Then he might do it because he he did it because he was tricked into it. He didn't. Do it because he wanted to do it. He was basically fooled into doing so. So I don't think he should bear any guilt because he was innocent. Yeah, that's our point. Thank you, Group Two. It's interesting you keep saying they were just following orders because that、uh, logic didn't save the Nazis after World War Two. At the trial of Nuremberg. Yeah, the Nazis all said we we're just following orders, and yet they were still sentenced anyway.、Um, and so perhaps you could、uh, rethink some parts of this question. The defense of I was just following orders failed because the judges believed that these soldiers had enough reason. To doubt the correctness of those orders, like if they really thought about what they were being told to do, the judges believe that they would have understood it was not the right thing to do. So the question of who should be guilty here depends on how、uh, how much space do they have to make a different decision. In your answer, you mentioned that in war you have to live first before you can choose to do anything else. But are there times in the novel where perhaps a different option is presented? When Ender watches the videos with Mazer Rackham, and Ender points out that they look like ants, so maybe humans have been misled. About the nature of these aliens, they're too quick to assume that they resemble ants in the way they think and the way their society is built.、Um, Ender does bring up the idea that maybe these aliens communicate in a different way. So maybe they're fighting humans not because each one wants the other dead, but because they don't know how to express the idea that I don't want to fight you. This idea is put in the book.、Uh, Ender asks Graf, "Is there another way?" And Graf says, "You can think about that after we win the war." Ender asks Major Rackham, "Is it possible this is just a miscommunication?" Rackham says, "It is possible, but we don't know for sure. So it's better that we win first." So going back to Group Two, do you think in this case? That it was still correct for 
Graf and the other military people and Ender to follow orders? Uh, could, uh, could you repeat the question again? Do, do I think it's... Since there seems to be a different alternative in the novel, Ender keeps asking these questions. And there's never a logical response. The response is only we have to make sure we don't lose. They never think about whether they have to fight in the first place. In this case, do you think it's still uh, acceptable for their defense to be we were just following orders? Um, I think uh, after how you explained, right, I think it's probably unreasonable for them to for me to say like they were following, following orders because I think they're old enough to understand what's right or wrong and and it's it's pretty stupid because uh, they're killing people and they should know it's probably wrong for, p for killing people even though they're following their orders of from the general the colonel but it's totally wrong to do so. Maybe they should think about why the war started in the first place, or how can we make the war stop by not not thinking, rather than thinking how we should murder them, how should we uh, decimate them. We should they should think of another way for the war to stop, but not thinking of how to kill them, how to destroy them like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think in your second answer, you also kind of reversed your position on Ender's guilt. Uh, you said that since like we, he had these questions and he, even though he didn't know it was a real war, he knew that in the future he would be fighting a real war. So he should still take some of the blame in the end. A little bit of the blame. Mm. Like uh, maybe in the Chinese idiom, like but I don't think it's suitable in this case because it's not like he only stole a pen from other people or stole candy. No, he killed a lot of people and basically murdered someone, right? That's literally first degree murder. So I don't think he probably should take a bit of blame by a bit. I mean, maybe a big portion of it since it's not, it's totally wrong to kill a lot of people. It's, it's like, it's not as serious as ethnic cleansing, but it's still war crimes. And even he, he, in his defense, he might say, oh, I don't know, I was just something like that, but it's still wrong, right? So maybe I should change my answer. I don't think he should take all the, all the blame, all the guilt, but he should definitely take some of it since he's a part of the action. He's doing a part of the killing action of, of it. So yeah, I, I changed my answer to it, to that. Okay, thank you to group two for giving us both sides of this question. Um, I wanted to I want to point out something uh, to to perhaps add another layer of thinking to this question. Um, group two said after my follow up question, it seems like they should still be guilty to some extent. But we can think about what I was saying. Uh, these characters, they say we have to win first. Yeah, and then we can decide who is to blame. They're all operating under the assumption that the aliens want to kill them. And when Ender says, maybe it's just miscommunication, Mazer Rackham says, maybe, but we can't know. I actually think that makes sense. Humans have been invaded by these aliens twice. Not once, twice. The first time might be a mistake, right? The second time they knew what they were doing. And it, so therefore the threat is a real threat. And until you can confirm that the threat is not real, you should still assume that there is a threat. That's basically what Major Rackham is saying. So if there is blame here, it is not because um, these humans wanted to fight the war. It is because, as Group 2 later said, they did not try to find other ways of stopping the war. There are some hints throughout the book that the aliens don't want to fight. 
in the in chapter 14, all of the battles are real, right? But not a single time do the aliens attack first. Especially in that last battle when the small human fleet is taking on a whole planet of aliens, the aliens don't attack first. Makes no sense if the aliens wanted to keep fighting. And if you go back to the movie, uh, there's a line where Ender asks, why do the aliens want to colonize other planets? And Maisel Rackham says it's because their water is running out and they need more water and space. To me, that doesn't sound like they want to fight wars. They simply want to live elsewhere. It sounds like maybe there's a space for negotiation in the middle if they could find a way to negotiate with aliens who don't talk. So the problem is not that humans want to fight the world. It's that they don't consider, as group two says, other ways to not be defeated. In a world, there's not only winning and losing, right? Sometimes both sides can just decide on a third way. OK, thank you. Other groups, do you have ideas or questions? All righty, let's move on to question five. Uh, so I talked to group four about this question. It's an interesting question because the novel Ender's Shadow, which is told from Bean's perspective, does exist. But here we're talking about this book as if it were imagined. Like if this book existed, what do you think it would look like? What could we understand from that book that we cannot get from this book? And group four mentions two things. One, in this book, Ender is the hero. He's the dude who has to win the war. He has so much pressure. Everybody is looking at him. And so he's almost entirely focused on that goal. Everything he learns, everything he does is to help himself and his uh, companions and other smart people be able to win the war against the aliens. And every situation that the adults put him in, every uh, interaction that he has with Valentine are all geared toward winning that war. Group four says Bean would not be under so much pressure. So if we look at this story through the eyes of Bean, maybe we would see more in this world than Ender does. Ender is only focused on one thing. He doesn't stop to look around. He doesn't observe how uh, people not related to the war are thinking and behaving. He doesn't notice the way that his world works. Um, all of the things that we have been talking about in class, basically Ender doesn't care about them. He only wants to win the war. But maybe Bean will notice. Maybe Bean would care. Maybe the story would be slower and have more detail and show us more of this fictional world. But the second point that group four mentions is that if we look at this story through Bean's perspective, maybe we would understand less about Ender's thinking and feeling. After all, Bean thinks of Ender as a hero, as someone better than him, someone who is inaccessible to him. So it's likely that Bean would not try to think what is Ender thinking? What is Ender feeling? Maybe he would spend more time trying to understand what Ender wants him to do. What are his orders? What are his goals? But only in this novel, when we see the world through Ender's eyes, do we get to hear Ender think? Do we get to feel what Ender feels? So that could also be something different if we look at this story from Bean's perspective. And um, I have read Ender Shadow, and I have to say group four is actually pretty accurate. That is basically what the novel feels like. Um, it's actually like 
about twice as as long as this one. As I, as group four said, there's more detail, but also because um, it gives us a lot more background about Earth as well. Uh, so it turns out that Ender Shadow Bean is an orphan. That's a good guru. He's surviving on the streets because he's really smart, and he gets saved by a nun. Just just more. Turn one to one, just more. Niku. That's not right. Shonu. Yeah, right. We're, this is a Western story. Um, and so like the nun realizes he's very smart and so lets him take the test for battle school and he gets into battle school. So the story is revolving around uh, how Bean faces his survival instincts that kept him alive on the streets but that only protect himself. And so those instincts don't work in an army. In an army, he has to think about his fellow soldiers. He has to think about the general goal and mission. He can't just always be protecting himself. And that's what that book is about. But of course, because Bean becomes part of Ender's army, uh, when he's learning about how to be part of an army, he's not a part of any army. He's part of the most important army in the world. Uh, so that also adds a, a twist to the story. Um, and so because that book has so much more detail, uh, if you are one of those readers who thinks that Ender's Game is too on the surface, uh, moves too fast, we don't really feel what's going on, you can consider reading uh, Ender's Shadow. Maybe it will draw you in a bit more. OK, uh, other thoughts or questions? We have now finished the book. So if you have thoughts about the book in general, now is a, uh, a good time to think about the whole book and consider any thoughts or questions that you might have. Next week, we're going to read an academic paper. Um, who does not yet have a copy? I'm going to pass these out right now. That's interesting. I have two extra copies, but everybody signed in. Very interesting. OK, so next week we're going to read this paper. It is an academic paper, so some parts might feel unfamiliar or not easy to understand. So I wanted to give you some tips about reading this. Uh, the best way to make sense of an academic paper is to first understand what it is trying to say. A lot of academic writing is simply giving you evidence and details and specific points, but the whole paper should talk about one thing. Uh, and so you can read the abstract on the first page to understand what the paper is about. Uh, let's read the abstract together. Alice Miller's work provides a theoretical framework to assess the effects of child abuse and its relationship to the development of creativity, hatred, and violence in the novel Ender's Game. So it looks like this paper will be talking about uh, on the one hand, how Ender is educated, right? Because it says development of creativity, hatred, and violence. But on the other hand, it will also look at this training 
from the viewpoint of child abuse, specifically child abuse as understood by this person, Alice Miller. So that's the main point of this paper. Uh, let's continue. Analysis focuses on the extent to which children are manipulated in order to meet the needs of adults. The presence of behaviors such as the repression of feelings and memories, the idealization of perpetrators, blind obedience to authority, and the expression of repressed feelings in destructive acts. And identification of a helping witness as predictors for the actions and outcomes in this story. Uh, okay, the sentence is a bit confusing because it should have used semicolons, fen ho, instead of the first and last comma. But it seems like there are three main points of analysis regarding child abuse. The first one is that children are manipulated in order to meet the needs of adults. So even though it's, it's training Ender, but the training is not for Ender. The training is for the adults around him. The second main point is a long list of symptoms of child abuse. So these are all signs that maybe this child is being abused. And the third point, beginning on the second to last line, is identification of a helping witness as predictors for the actions and outcomes in this story. So something about a helping witness. This sounds like a good guy, somebody who would help. So the second sentence we can also split into three parts, right? Abuse in terms of uh, manipulating children for the benefit of adults. What kind of signs uh, can we see of abuse in the novel? And what effect does someone have who tries to help Ender in this abusive environment? So now you have a general idea of what this paper is about. It is not exactly a, it's a short paper, but in terms of what you usually read, maybe it may be a bit long. It's uh, 12 pages. It's technically 11 pages because like the last page is a list of references. Um, so if it's too long and you have trouble understanding what's going on, uh, in academic writing especially, the main point of each paragraph should be the first sentence. So if you're reading and you're not quite sure what you're reading, go back to the first sentence of the paragraph. Usually that will help you understand what's going on. Um, another thing about academic writing is it's usually not uh, stylistically creative. Like when we read the novel, we have new words for things that don't exist in the real world. Or sometimes they will use new words for thing that, things that do exist, like the word tunes, T-O-O-N-S. T-O-O-N-S. Ah, Microsoft Teams can't spell. Instead of platoons, like a, a small group of soldiers. Um, but when you're reading an academic article, the language should be very realistic and uh, precise. So you probably won't run into creative language problems. If you do run into language problems, it's probably due to sentence structure or vocabulary. Um, but once you understand what the language is saying, the ideas should not be too hard to understand. One last thing about um, literary academic writing in particular. Uh, in this department, we don't have a lot of opportunities to read literary criticism, professional academic literary criticism. This kind of writing is written also for people who have not read the novel. 
the idea is that this kind of scholarship should be understandable to anyone, not just to people who know about the story. So a lot of this paper is simply uh, summarizing what happens in the novel. But these summaries are all there to prove the author's point. They are evidence. They're not just an objective neutral summary. So next week, one of the questions will be, do you trust these summaries? Or do you think they might be too biased? That's an advantage that we have as people who have actually read this book. OK, do you have questions about next week? And then after the discussion next week, I will introduce the final exam. OK, if you don't have questions, let's jump back to the uh, author's introduction. First page. It makes me a little uncomfortable writing an introduction to Ender's Game. This is, I think, a great beginning to an author's introduction. Think about it. What is an author's introduction? It's not a preface, Xu Yan, Xu Wen. A preface is an author talking about like how this book was written, uh, why you may want to read it. An author's introduction only appears if the book becomes famous or important and is republished. And they want the original author to introduce this thing that they wrote a long time ago. So by its very definition, an author's introduction is kind of arrogant, kind of pompous. It's assuming that this book is important enough that uh, people will want to know what you were thinking back then. In that sense, the way that he starts this introduction is pretty smart. He doesn't say, I know people think this is an important book. He doesn't say this book has made me so much money. He says it makes me a little uncomfortable writing an introduction to Ender's Game. It's a very humble beginning. By beginning with such humility, he gains a bit more trust from the reader. And he continues like this. After all, the book has been in print for six years now, and in all that time, nobody has ever written to me to say, you know, Ender's Game was a pretty good book, but you know what it really needs? An introduction. So this is telling us he knows that this is not something that has to be done uh, to make the book better. It's simply something that the publisher wanted him to do. Right, as he says in the next sentence. And yet, when a novel goes back to print for a new hardcover edition, wow, a new hardcover edition, usually when a book is republished, we republish it as a paperback, but he says that this is being written for a new hardcover, now that is pretty special. So for a new hardcover edition, there ought to be something in it to mark the occasion. Something besides the minor changes as I fix the errors and internal contradictions and stylistic excesses that have bothered me ever since the novel first appeared. This uh, parenthetical statement is traditional. In any new edition, usually the author will say, I went back and I fixed some problems or I fixed some spelling mistakes. But the way that he writes this is also kind of interesting. He doesn't say it out loud. He puts it in a parenthesis as a kind of, oh, by the way, I also did this. And this has the same idea as starting off with humility. Uh, it's saying, uh, by putting the, this idea in parentheses, he's saying, I know it's not important enough that people will care about the mistakes, but I personally care. So, by the way, I went back to fix some mistakes. Uh, so the whole opening paragraph of this introduction 
is meant to assure the reader that this is not a so-called important book, that it is still, as the author says in the next sentence, so be assured the novel stands on its own, that the book itself is still the same book, more or less. Nothing important is being added by this introduction. Right, he continues by saying, and if you skip this intro and go straight to the story, I not only won't stand in your way, I'll even agree with you. It's a very humble first paragraph, but is it an accurate paragraph? Is this introduction really not important at all? Would the reader still have the same experience reading the book without first reading the introduction? I don't think so. I think that the introduction says some very important things about how the author was thinking about his story, what ideas he tried to put in the story, what kind of readership, what kind of audience he predicted for this book. And also, like he talks about some reader reactions. So I think even though the author is very humble and he says, oh, this introduction is not important, you can skip it, no difference. I think it's doing a very important job of managing reader expectations. Think about it. When you go into a movie theater, do you pick any movie at random? Or do you first choose the movie before you go? Most people choose a movie first. They have some kind of expectation for the movie that they're going to see. But if your expectation does not fit the actual movie, no matter how good the movie is, you will feel a little bit disappointed. The same thing for a book. So what the author is doing in this introduction is he is managing the reader's expectation. Maybe uh, someone recommended this book to the reader. Maybe your teacher assigned it to you in class. You personally don't have any expectations about this book. But after reading the introduction, the author hopes that you will have the proper expectations to enjoy the book. So the introduction is doing something important, even though the author says it's not. He's simply being humble. Uh, and then he goes on to recount the publication history of the story, the background for why he wrote it. Then he talks about uh, how people have received it, especially people who didn't like it. And he kind of argues back against the people who didn't like it. Uh, and then he goes on to give long evidence about people who did like it. Right, so the whole thing is written to help us, to help put us in the proper mindset to enjoy what the author wants us to see in this book. From that point of view, if you think back to what we have been talking about in this class, some points were expected by the author. Ender, the boy genius, isolated, abused, his leadership, his psychological issues related to Peter and Valentine. But some things I think the author would not expect. We talked about some gay aspects of the story. We talked about how uh, maybe the world of the story is doing too much in order to force that conclusion. Uh, and so I think this is one benefit of, I guess we can call this the game of literary criticism. When everyone, including the author, is trying to brainwash you into reading something in one way only. It could be useful to think deeper about some elements in the story in order to get a different perspective. Not that any one perspective is better or more important, but perhaps 
the more perspectives you can see, the more options you have. And the more you can think about which perspective fits my idea of a good time or a good life or a good book. So, yeah, I basically that's what I hope you have uh, been able to take from this class. The benefits of reading deeper. And we will have one example of deeper reading when we take a look at a professional academic paper next week. OK, let's stop here.